There's this little action RPG series I fell in love with called Seiken Densetsu. If you've been around the channel at all, you'll know I covered them years ago. I don't want to do that this time. Not exactly. The big missing piece, something I wanted to cover back then and fell out of because audience interest wasn't there, is Sword of Mana, the lone GBA title. Back then, I saw the game as a limp remake of the very first Mana title, so not worth covering in detail. Sword of Mana is a fascinating culmination of design sensibilities accrued throughout multiple games, a crucial fulcrum on which the future of Mana hinged, and absolutely representative of its series. The way it gets treated by some people for being a budget handheld title is downright criminal. This video is a long-form look at the aesthetics, design, and meaning of the Seiken Densetsu franchise through the lens of Sword of Mana. The series is big, and it's a bit of a walk from its origins to the Game Boy Advance, so go ahead! Bust out the ice cubes. Pop your corn. Before we get further, I have to acknowledge the M word. Mana is the Western word for the games. The series is called Seiken Densetsu in Japan, or Legend of the Sacred Sword, because it was originally a game about finding Excalibur, jammed into a whopping five floppies! But the project fell through, and the Seiken Densetsu trademark was reused for an action RPG, a Final Fantasy spin-off on the Game Boy, Final Fantasy Gaiden, or Final Fantasy Adventure in the West, and Mystic Quest in the Other West. The project was directed by Koichi Ishii, and while it's got its own unique elements, it's still saddled with Final Fantasy iconography. Not truly mana. This part of the history is important because Sword of Mana is a retelling of the Final Fantasy adventure story, the technical origin point of mana. Even if 1993's much more recognizable secret of mana is the first manifestation of the mana identity in some. And proper mana identity is something I care about. It's the beauty of the series, escaping from another IP's grasp and standing on its own. Man is a weird word, isn't it? It's not a household term, really. In the West, it's probably best recognized as the fictional resource drawn from the land, allowing players to cast spells in Magic the Gathering, as another word for MP bar in games like Diablo, and for the more religiously inclined, as a food provided to the Israelites by God as they traveled in the desert. It's hard to know where the term mana originates, like how it ended up in the games and what it's based on, because that'd at least be quality grounds for an interpretation of intended pronunciation. The Trials of Mana remake says, So I say mana, though admittedly many people are already frustrated that I haven't said mana. Mana is a word that spans multiple cultures and means different things in each. Mostly spiritual things. The word means something like character or ethos in certain cultures, spiritual energy in others, and powerful natural forces like wave and wind in others still. If we took the Hawaiian version of the word as the origin point, we'd use mana without question. In game, mana is connected to a lot of proper nouns, the mana tree, the mana clan, the mana sword, all of which are interlinking parts of a spiritual whole. Mana itself is described as the source of all life on Earth, a natural but simultaneously supernatural force. As far as I can tell, that puts it midway between its proto-oceanic origin and Polynesian theology. So mana it is. We know mana in game is connected to the natural world supernaturally because of the mana spirit, magical beings present in most games that command the power of the elements, fire, earth, water, etc., but it's a strange proposition to keep mana in the lowly realm of elemental video game magic, because mana is also elevated to a heavenly level frequently, with the mana tree also present in every game, literally providing life to all things on the planet, and in most games, it's a tree that is, in part or in whole, enabled to exist by a woman from the mana tribe who sacrifices her human existence to become the mana goddess. Religiosity, the signs and symbols of faith, are baked directly into the series. So where did the series' creative roots shoot from? Koichi Ishii, the creator of Seiken Densetsu, wanted to create a fictional world. You know, fantasy land. We all know that friend who's brewing a D&D &D campaign or writing a book. It's a rite of passage for creators. And video games are the perfect medium to do that. A blend of physical exploration, accompanying music and visuals, a crafted experience that could transcend a novel with interactivity. He describes the series as, in fact, not a series, but a world to be explored, with each game representing a different instance or a different version of said world. And I think that's why the game
games resonated with me. Looking at them up front, there's not a lot to get excited by. I mean, they're colorful and look playable. Characters are moving around and attacking. Seems like fun. But the whimsy of childhood, the need to explore a fantastical place, really hits you when you sit down with them. Ishii has several inspirations, from Lord of the Rings to Alice in Wonderland to Moomin. What a king. Regardless, the games universally convey the feeling of wandering into a forest as a kid in search of adventure. And that's a special thing to capture. So, a brief history of second Densetsu before Sword of Mana. The first game is a 91 Game Boy title that's mechanically inferior to something like Link's Awakening, but isn't awful considering the hardware. Players battle through the world with pickup companions that filter out every other dungeon or so and use various equipable weapons to traverse the world. It's an action game, so boss battles are a major focus. The player untangles the legend of the Geminites and the Mana Tree in a quest to save the world from the hilariously named Dark Lord. The hero and you've been trying to save from Dark Lord sacrifices herself to become the Mana Tree. Roll credits. Secret of Mana is a 93 SNES title that definitively established Mana as its own IP, Koichi Ishii's Baby. The player gathers a three-person party and battles through colorful environments to save the world. It's the first to utilize the art of Hiro Isono to highlight the weight and importance of nature in the world of Mana. While the innovative ring menu was programmed to keep the on-screen action flowing without the use of a menu screen, it ended up turning the combat, played optimally, into an endless magical span fast as the player could recover from casting a spell and cue another almost infinitely without allowing bosses to act. At one point, the mana tree is destroyed by a technologically advanced airship and the heroes use the mana sword to defeat the villains and subdue the raging mana beast which was spawned as a primal defense mechanism against the enemies of the mana tree. The End Trials of Mana is a 95 SNES title and among the highest quality on the console. It's extremely ambitious, featuring gorgeous sprite work, a totally rehauled combat system that effectively prevents overt mechanical abuse, and six playable characters, from which the player selects three, each with light and dark class trees to delve, and three potential storylines to boot depending on the choice of main character. If your neurons aren't firing just hearing that stuff, I mean, now it's okay. Maybe our star signs aren't compatible or something. Something. Unfortunately, it wouldn't hit the West legitimately until the Nintendo Switch's Mana Collection in 2019, rendering it all but unknown in the Western public conscious. Last is Legend of Mana, the 99 PSX title most notable for turning the entire series on its head with 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up gameplay. An unbelievable wealth of superfluous and entertaining gameplay systems from farming to monster taming to magical spell creating to forging to ability mixing and that's still not everything! Thing. Temporary party members would join the player, much like Final Fantasy Adventure, and the game featured multiple major plot threads that could be engaged with or dropped at will. What really sold the world was its music, composed by Yoko Shinomura of Kingdom Hearts fame among many, many others, and the visual design of Shinichi Kamaoka, Koji Suda, and Nao Akeda, each contributing to different aspects that, in symphony, transformed the mana IP into something truly visually unique. The series looked and played very differently in every installment up until Sword of Mana's release. It's integral to the design, changing things up, being many things, accommodating player choice in a way many games wouldn't allow for, even letting the player opt in or out of story content. They spoke to me because they were colorful, fun, and subversive. Even nowadays, posting any kind of opinion about the story of a video game will prompt absolutely unhinged responses from people who regard the thing as doctrine. Mana twice said, take it or leave it, either way. I respect Koichi Ishii's design sensibilities because I share the opinions implicitly backing them. If you're going to present a world to other people, let them engage with it how they want to. If you're going to write a story, don't assume everyone's going to love it as much as you do. If you're going to write fantasy, either start subverting genre tropes or really lean into it. If you're going to put yourself out there as colorful and strange as you may be, own it. Mana is unapologetically itself, and still allows players to find themselves in the work. That's something many games don't leave room for. And that brings us to Sword of Mana. A 2003 GBA title and the triumphant series return to handheld consoles, Sword of Mana is an artistic vision coalesced. That's higher praise than I thought I'd ever give. In case you don't know, handheld systems, pre-Nintendo Switch era, so Game Boy, GBA, DS, PSP, etc., whatever the case, 
or budget systems. When you bought a new game, you knew you were trading fidelity, performance, raw quality for a cheaper price tag. I remember growing up with handheld games sitting at $40 and console games being $60. Times change. The handheld market existed as a kind of money mill, in theory. A dev team could work through a brisk schedule with simpler hardware, churn out a game, cut a whole third of the major console standard price tag, and take home a profit. Piles of garbage shovelware exist specifically on the handhelds, and the games that exist in a tier of their own, the Pokemons and Fire Emblems, tend to come from studios that handled handheld development regularly. Sort of Mana is anything but a quick cash-in. I mean, admittedly, the game had a year and change in development time, and evidence exists that parts of the story were cut, potentially to meet deadlines, but the experience in some exhibits change in direction for the series, and the reclamation of identity. And fans of Final Fantasy Adventure absolutely hated it. It was called everything from a sloppy remake to a bastardization of the Mana series. Basic, bare bones, in a word, crap the worst mana game. It didn't even score all that well with reviewers, despite being a functioning, well-realized handheld title. Which is wild, having played every game in order, excluding Sword, then looping back around to play Sword. The game is good. Total mana fan service. Inoffensive at worst. It bears repetition that Sword of Mana is a remake of the first game, Final Fantasy Adventure. It features a similar world map, almost all the same names and places, a boy, or girl this time, goes in search of the Mana Sword to destroy the Dark Lord, hilariously still referred to as Dark Lord, and save the world in the name of the Mana Goddess. And don't worry, I know, this isn't the only remake. Mana's had lots of remakes pop up through its lifespan, notably the doomed remake of Secret of Mana, and the more recent and well-received Trials of Mana remake. But the PS Vita also got Adventures of Mana, basically the game some fans thought Sword of Mana would have been. I have nothing useful to say about the game, because it's as clean-cut as can be, a more aesthetically pure redo of a Game Boy game with superior gameplay, faithful enough to the original that it recreates the remnants of Final Fantasy seeding the work from chocobos to black mages. In short, nothing anyone who loves mana needs to pay attention to. I mean, it's just the first game. Again. I like the game I'm talking about today because it shows creative initiative, a willingness to compartmentalize everything about the series' success thus far, consider everything that made it great. If fans want to be sticks in the mud about old things told new, I mean just about any phone can run Final Fantasy Adventure, so... Have at it. Sword of Mana is really weird, for a lot of reasons, mainly aesthetically, story-wise, gameplay-wise, so everything, I guess? It's a mega mashup, a fusion experience informed by a lineage of design. I keep saying that, but I'm not showing examples. I'm gonna break the next slug of the video into segments for gameplay, aesthetics, and story. And maybe we can wrangle these concepts into something cohesive. Let's start with an important one. Maybe the most important one. Aesthetics. How you present your game, which artists and composers you hire, what colors you focus on, and to take a more broad brush approach, what style informs the work. All of these things are visual storytelling languages. They all convey meaning and harmony. Bonus points if the aesthetics actually weave well with the gameplay and narrative, you know form design harmonies. And I'd like to step back to Secret of Mana here, the first game to really establish mana as its own IP. I mentioned the colors and the cartoony designs, but the figure who looms largest in mana's overall aesthetic direction, the one who speaks best to design intentions, is renowned artist Hiro Isono, a Japanese artist born in 1945. Isono's work is simplistic at 10 paces, but challenging up close. His works all focus intently on the complexity, the sheer depth of nature, featuring myriad minute details and ethereal, even Edenic landscapes. There's a saccharine quality to his paintings which tend to elevate nature, portray it as free of flaw and all-encompassing, even Homey, they're easy to get lost in. I appreciate the mana-specific arts because they resist the idea that the natural world can be readily captured, understood, through a mere portrait. He was presumably commissioned for Secret of Mana and for future games because 
That's kind of the point of mana. In a game where the mana tree is the source of all life on Earth, where the mana sword and the mana clan are subservient, lower on the totem pole than the mana tree, it's a fictional universe that places nature above everything. All human creations, all people. People feed the tree in most games. The work Isono did for mana specifically shows the characters absolutely dwarfed by the scope and grandeur of nature, given no more importance than the birds or a small shrub, only they stand apart with their colorful clothes and weapons, drops of paint at the bottom of the canvas, ready to enter, but with no more fanfare than any other forest creature. It's profoundly humbling, especially to sell a game's protagonists this way. Though Asono's work was used for several games both pre- and proceeding the subject of this video, it was untapped specifically for Legend and Sword of Mana. I still think it's important to appreciate Asono's work, just in general, but to Mana specifically for visualizing something Koichi Ishii wanted to convey about his world. The character designs are also worth exploring. In Secret of Mana, characters were officially represented in clay sculpts, featured in the game manual, and in Trials of Mana, the original character design was handled by Nobu Teruyuki. They're really evocative, dynamic designs, much sharper than anything from the first game, and all of this is laced with Koichi Ishii's own monster designs, the famous Rabbite, and many, many others that would form a bedrock of fantastical, childlike whimsy. The forest creatures aren't scary, they're cute and funny, though they can stunlock you to death in the first game, and honestly f*** that. But character design shifted in Legend of Mana with the art of Shinichi Kamaoka, whose work is iconic to say the least. His art also appeared in Brownie Brown's Magical Vacation, and more recognizably, Magical Star Sign, among others. Despite never owning Sword of Mana as a kid, I remember the art perfectly. I remember specifically just how veering on uncanny the art is. His characters tend to be painterly, highly detailed, incorporating many accessories, like the camp of FFTA's Lusso Clemens, for example, but they make use of muted tones in general. And the Legend of Mana designs in particular often include animalian features or natural elements, casting anything purely human as strange by comparison. It's iconic because it's so bizarre, but it's also perfect for Mana, a series that highlights magical whimsy and the triumph of the natural world over people and industry. Sword of Mana makes use of the same style, though slightly less weird, mostly Julius, we gotta talk about them toads. It wholesale repurposes the general aesthetic direction in landscape, characters, and towns. Admittedly, Legend of Mana was relatively new to the series when Sword released, so adopting the art style may have set alarm bells off in some fans' heads. It can be hard to wrap your head around a new aesthetic, especially if you're really a fan of the Nobutera Yuki designs or the goobery clay lumps. But I think that regardless of the line specifics, vibrant, flagrant design was always the guiding principle with Mana protagonists. If anything, the Sword of Mana protags are comparatively muted, with minimal color variants. They look more normal than Jurin or Randy, but it's fitting if the design conceit since Secret of Mana remains that nature is greater than humankind. And the colors, the palette choices, are incredible. The game world simulates the passage of time with a day-night cycle, not unheard of in handhelds, but certainly uncommon. The player watches traditional fantasy land, all greens and browns and yellows, transform as the night falls, giving way to teal grass and purple rock. It's like the land itself is seeded with magic, because it is. Mana, the magic, not the series, is the Earth. So many games in the GBA's library don't bother with the extra effort and feel comparatively flat. Lifeless. False. But Sword of Mana, this dinky handheld title nobody really cares about, is not the budget cash-in it could have been. So the models are on point, the visuals are A+, plus, everything is going good. And the music's good too. Unfortunately, being a GBA game, the OST is crushed and sounds pretty tinny overall. It's hard to recommend as listening, and in fact, this video is scored with everything short of Sword of Mana's OST. But again, considering the hardware, it's serviceable. What's 
actually notable is the return of composer Kenji Ito, who handled the original score for Final Fantasy Adventure. Mana had incredible composers throughout, and it feels like a sort of concession to older fans having Ito return. Not that his work is lackluster, it's fantastic. The ending theme I use in my credits is an arranged Ito piece, and Sword of Mana does represent a revision of history, joining the old and new in celebration of how far mana came. So, how does new age, low budget mana play? I'd like to keep this portion of the video short because it's a really simple game. You move around in 2D space, tap the attack button in time to combo up to three hits, and that's about it. Okay, obviously there's a lot more going on under the hood and even in practice, but that's most of the play summed up in a compound sentence. What's actually interesting about the play is how it stacks up compared to the other games. Final Fantasy Adventure is really weak. I described the action in 2019 as something you have to feel out more than react to. Enemies don't provide proper feedback when attacked and will simply walk into you. It's annoying at best. Secret of Mana is comparatively freeing. Ignoring the magic spam nonsense, the mechanics are all pretty sharp and some interesting tech exists. But the basic flow of the early game involves tapping the attack button in rhythm with your cooldown meter to do damage, and later on charging and releasing special attacks forever. It's playable enough. Trials of Mana reacted to the previous game's issues by turning combat mode on, as it were, as you approached enemies, more or less forcing combat wherein the player was effectively playing a real-time JRPG, as enemy attacks couldn't be meaningfully dodged, so it was a real-time DPS race with a party of characters you formed yourself. I want to say team construction mattered, but some characters were flat broken. Sword of Mana learned from these games and translated several console mechanics to handheld perfectly. That's a win on its own, but let's look at some specifics. You're free to move around when enemies are on screen like Secret of mana, but you're not restricted to waiting for a bar to fill up to attack. You're able to use movement to dodge attacks, unlike in Trials. And while magic is high utility and useful, it's entirely optional for either character, requiring the player to invest both in finding hidden mana spirits in the world and apply dexterity to their spell casting. It's not free and easy like before. In short, they fixed Secret of Mana's dead air waiting problem, fixed Trials of Mana's low dexterity allowance problem, and balanced out magic Magic's ridiculously efficient investment to damage ratio. It's hard to pretend they made the game poorly. I prefer Trials of Mana and the team building JRPG component myself, but this is the first top down mana game since Final Fantasy Adventure that acts like a functioning action RPG should. You'll notice I ignored Legend of Mana in that breakdown, because Legend is genuinely subversive, out in the field, doing its own thing, and that's good, but it doesn't really speak to the lineage enough to include here. Legend is still present though. Fittingly, the Legends of Mana content is found in subsystems. Crafting. You can enter these pop-up cactus houses. Shut up! It's mana, it's cool. Where you'll meet your old pal, Lil Cactus, ripped straight out of Legends. A facsimile of the tree where you can grow produce with seeds to help temper weapons and armor at the forge. That's right, smash your rhino loop and apple socks into your armor for power. I love mana. What about the original game, though? What did they keep? and improve. You still gather and make use of various weapons from axes to sickles just like the first game, but several only make sense with a magic build because they're just not strong or quick enough to warrant frequent use. In fact, several lack any kind of combo, which puts the fists, the sword, and even the slower axe a cut above most weapons in terms of raw DPS. I don't think that's a problem. Several ranged and crowd striking options exist, it just never feels worthwhile. Unless, Again, you're in a magic build because weapon type determines the shape of your spell casts. Even then, fists are probably your best bet. I don't want to get too into this because raw magic is easily the most frustrating way to play the game. It's an improvement over the original, but not enough of one. Though Secret of Mana had trouble making every weapon super worthwhile too. So it's a decent upgrade from the original. The class system also returns. Well, it wasn't really a class system before, just a number of stats you could throw points into, and by the end, everything kind of gelled together anyway, making choice 
kind of irrelevant. Sword overhauled it, but unfortunately it's nothing nearly as interesting as Trials of Mana, which has genuine team building via the allotted skills provided to the player in class selection. Instead, if you put enough points into the right class options, you'll get some passive abilities that are good, but want the player aggressively investing in one over the course of the game. It's still an RPG, and you can still get invested in your character. You can pretty easily overpower yourself, too, as long as you're engaging with the systems. But it's not as deep as Legends or Trials, and so it's a game for the more action-oriented fans. Arguably the ones that can't get past Secret of Mana's Borked Magic. Oh, and it has companions. They're terrible, but like most mana games, you can tweak the AI so they're not constantly getting one shot, but altogether, yeah, mana is always best played with friends. Something I've never actually done, so I'm used to it, but it's a notable series weakness. And unlike other series games, this is explicitly your story, and it isn't built with co-op play in mind, so it kind of makes sense, regardless of whether it's annoying or not. You're the hero, do the damage. Aside from pilfering from its own IP cache, Sword of Mana added entirely new content as well. Side quests abound, they're stuffed into every town, and most of them aren't worth your time time or energy. Legend of Mana did side content too, on top of like most RPGs, so it's not new. What's interesting is how they serve largely to get players invested in the world rather than offering incredible rewards. Sure, a lot of them are dead air. One as you talk to every NPC in town handing out flyers. No thanks. But one of them deals directly with questions of faith and leads to pretty clear religious persecution. This man's literally getting taken away by the secret police. He's going to Gulag. There's also a ton of missable GBA link only stuff like acquiring summons, full screen attacks from other games. And all this stuff is effectively lost. Nobody's walking around with a Game Boy Advance, a link cable, and sort of mana on hand, even at gaming conventions. They had to have known a quick five years would invalidate the work done for the system, but they went for it anyway. Publisher mandate, a remnant of Seiken Densetsu's popularity in Japan, it's hard to say. Now it's just more evidence of the team tapping into its own IP's roots to sell mana on every front. But Sword never really strays from its purpose, not when innovating nor pillaging the successes of other games. It's a remake. So you wander from town to town, explore colorful environments, litter the realm with corpses, and battle a series of bosses. And for once, just once, there's nothing special to say about them. They're all typical mana chaff, plot enemies that move around and take hits, occasionally they deal damage, but they're all the same kind of stuff you've seen before, provided you've played any of these. One or two of them are more action-oriented, like designed specifically for an action game. The one Mind Flayer fight is sat on top of a spinning platform, and that's frustrating, but interesting. And this living plant boss needs magic or a bow to take down with any kind of efficiency. But overall, bop them 50 times and they're done. Not every boss from the original appears, and several have been outright replaced, but the game is pretty faithful to its source material, even when it's unhelpful. But it's hard to criticize overall. The game outwardly lifts bosses from Trials of Mana, like the Crab, and even basic enemies like Werewolves, the Guardian who appears in most Mana games. It's a deeply referential work, and this quirk comes back to bite it in the story. Sword of Mana's most jarring inclusion, flying in the face of everything the series has been up until this point, is the inclusion of a linear, traditional story with characters, and twists, and everything. It's a lot. Just... A lot of text. You've got to understand, the first game introed with Dark Lord and was told in comparatively few text boxes. Secret of Mana's was more ambitious, but fairly lackluster and disjointed. Hard to take seriously and hard to remember. Trials of Mana's was also ambitious, but it was three different stories, and I guarantee you, few players ever experienced the whole thing. And really, up until Legend, the overall quality of the stories was pretty low, either because of simplistic ideas, bad translations, simply having story be optional. I never got the sense that story was at the forefront. Challenging the player with something truly interesting was never on the table. Legend of Mana broke away with some pretty high quality pathos, especially the Jumi arc that I recommend players hunt for, but one optional subsection of a game's story does not a critical masterpiece make. No disrespect, by the way, if you play Legend of Mana, 
you're probably all right. And none of this is an issue for a video game. You don't need to write a novel, just enough to lubricate the gameplay or to make the journey worthwhile. But Sword of Mana is working with history here, literally retelling the original story. Its Japanese title is Shinyaku Sekundensetsu, literally a New Testament, the legend of the sacred sword. I mean, Ishii. That yeah. shit ain't even subtle, bro! And between historical faithfulness, really really digging in with the script length and being highly referential in general, to say nothing of that title, Sword of Mana is saying that the Mana story matters. Let's inquire further. So what is the Mana story? How is it told? We intro with the world's creation myth. The Mana Goddess creating all life with the help of summoned spirits, notably wielding hope in one hand and the Sword of Mana in the other, which is ultimately cast away in the name of establishing peace symbolically. She transforms herself into a tree to sustain life on Earth, presumably by physically rooting into the world. Cut to one of the characters' backstories, whoever you picked. Their childhood got schmucked up by Dark Lord, unsurprisingly. It's a tale of religious persecution, the male character's father harboring Mana Clan survivors who were unceremoniously hunted by Dark Lord because he's a bad guy and wants bad things. The game doubles down, letting the player know that Dark Lord is bad, by having Bogard himself, a name from Mana history, challenge Dark Lord. Now, Sword of Mana weaves two stories into one, and the two paths diverge a little more than you might expect, but I'll be following the male protagonist through first and supplementing where appropriate. Like the first game, you wake up in an arena, a gladiator in service to the realm. After a battle, you and your friend Willy escape, only for Dark Lord to send you over the bridge. It's actually fascinating how much Sword is willing to reuse already established names. Dark Lord, Willy, it's impossible to take seriously without severe mental restraint. They actually reuse city names and even archetypal character names pretty frequently too. There's almost always a city called Wendell. Watts might as well be Sid at this point. And that all lends credence to the idea that Ishii's games are not a series, but a world with many versions. Anyhow, you survive, meet the girl, barely recognize her from childhood, and it turns out you're both headed to Wendell, and the passageway's been sealed off by some guy in a mansion. You'll often meet strangely colored individuals and characters straight out of Trials of Mana. That's Belladonna on screen. I'm not really ready to work through that yet. The hall turns out to be extremely spooky, and the master wants to put the female protag in a box and put her asleep because the Mana Clan is being hunted, and he can help her stay safe. Unfortunately, it's all very poorly communicated, to our eight intelligence warrior, and there's a boss fight. The next major plot point happens in Wendell. You meet two Geminites, the old sage Sibba and Bogard, both sworn to protect the mana tree. Dark Lord interrupts with his mage Julius, and they kidnap the female protagonist. There's a brief interlude where Sumo has a sword forged for him that is relevant to the plot, as he grapples with historical forces beyond his reckoning and the obvious arms race mentality he's developed to destroy Dark Lord by simply becoming stronger. And more more than that, there's a moment where he finds out that the dwarves also sell weapons to Grand's Realm, the oppressive nation that Dark Lord presides over, and he has a genuine moment of conflict over it because, yes, he's buying weapons from an imperialist stooge crew. In a mana game, we're actually dealing with the intersection of social strata, capital, labor, oppression, most real ass thing we've seen in what, like, five games? Meeting with Sibba later on establishes the major conflict Sumo has going forward. If he's willing to wield a weapon, is he any better than Dark Lord? If he's willing to kill, is he any better than this tyrannical dictator? I have some thoughts on that, but I guess I'll hold them for now. Though Sibba at least acknowledges that all beings, animals, humans, Mavolians, like the vampire from earlier, all originate from mana, so they're all fundamentally alike. Good. They attempt a rescue, which goes nowhere. Man, Mana likes falling scenes. Get it? He's falling so he can climb back up the narrative to another character building moment. Do you get that? The plot expands from here with the tale of Lester and Amanda, brother and sister. Lester being both unfortunately named and turned into a bird, so the party goes to kill Medusa, which will break the curse. Medusa appeared in the original, but it's definitely one of those characters that could use a total overhaul so that it's not turning mana into a syncretic, multi-origin work, especially when Ishii really cares about putting his original designs and silly little rabbit goobers into the world. But anyway, this ends with Medusa dying, which sucks because she had a history with Bogard, but ignore that, Dark Lord and his other buddy Devious appear, 
You're killing me with the names. They walk in and we learn some valuable info that Dark Lord, also known as Stroud, who later was used in Dawn of Mana alongside the Mavolian concept. Stroud and Devious are related via their Mavol blood and whoops, Lady Medusa was their mother. Cringe. He gets revenge by turning Amanda against the party, and you're made to kill her by tapping to attack. The game literally won't progress until you press A to kill. It's not a bad moment. God of War did this kind of stuff too, but I don't remember doing that on GBA ever. So there's a lot of moving parts to the story, some interesting social commentary that's life applicable as most fiction lessons are having been written by human beings. I know some people reject that, but please pull the blinders back and breathe reality in. And we've got aspirational gameplay narrative integration. It's kind of confusing with the amount of lore required to fully grasp but it's okay. Translation is kind of sus, though. What a sad thing that happened. Okay, that's just crazy. Ah, censorship. Maybe we can put a big old Mario noise over that instead. You know, let Sumo say f <laughs> This leads to more self-reflective fluff. Are we just as bad as them? No, obviously not. Medusa went insane and you protected yourself. Plus, Amanda's brother was a bird. You know, context matters here. A dungeon later and you put Devious down, but you don't kill him. That task, because our hero is having a murderer crisis, goes to Gormon from Trials of Mana. Oh, I just assumed he was working for Dark Lord, but it's weird that he's casually collecting villain souls in the middle of I'm um, trying to have a plot. Why are you mucking things up, Gormon? Why are you here? He leaves and we get a perspective shot of all the characters we've met so far. These happen a few times and really give the sense that Ishii wants this to be looked at as a serious story. And fair enough, it's putting the work in. The problem is, mostly, that it's weighed down by a number of extraneous elements, colored to the original story, and refuses to rename Willy, Lester, and Dark Lord. Still got value, no doubt about that, but those moments are far too few and we're mostly worried in the plot about becoming a murderer. Like, every kid playing this is like, Yeah! Kill Dark Lord! Kill! The showdown with Dark Lord reveals that he's doing what he does because of his ambitions. Okay, so he's black mana aligned. What does that mean? We don't know. But we do know that the game thinks violence solves nothing and is willing to equivocate Sumo and Dark Lord, a guy who commits hate crimes against a necessary religious sect. Because Sumo has killed maybe two people, and not even directly. Fairly cringe. Let's hope that gets resolved. Gormon returns, and I guess he's gonna be the final boss now. What's this all about, dude? Gormon was a major boss in Trials of Mana, like one of the branches, but he wasn't even the canon branch's final boss. I guess Ishii just likes Gormon. The story's length is a detriment because the game should probably end here, near the 10 hour mark, but it doesn't, and adds more characters in unnecessarily bloating the tale while you're forced through this protracted lore dump via Siba in a desert inn. A whole mini journey later and we come across the rusted mana sword and grapple with the reality that a weapon won't make Sumo stronger. It's all about heart. And you know, training, intention. Discipline, everything that isn't this Genki Shonen schlock. I'm being a cynic, and this is Magic Place, but still. On that note, the game is so willing to give inter-party sequences like where it is supposed to like Willy, and this person Sela, and Siba, and Bogard, and really, I don't care about them at all. They're not the classic characters they're treated like. They didn't win hearts, okay? They're relevant in the fiction, but that's about it. I think it's easier personally to love Dragon Age's Ogryn more intently than any single person on screen in this game. After this, it's just Dime Tower and the finisher, right on track with the original. Feel sad because the robot sacrifices itself. We will hold them in our hearts for all times. So the party arrives in Eden, the Mana Sanctuary. Basically, and there it is. Julius was the real bad guy. He tries to shake our confidence by revealing that Bogard sacrificed his wife to the mana tree, something the mana clan is known to do, so that's not particularly interesting. Uh, that Lester was mildly relieved when his sister was being taken away because of her oppressive love. Okay, he's got anxiety or a lower tolerance for affection, big deal. And Willie ran as a child when the village was attacked. Holy f- oh. And finally, the female protag was jealous of Sumo having parents when they were children. Oh my god, my confidence is in disrepair. The game even has Julius say, That's your idea of friendship? Accepting each other's faults? Bro, are you even a conscious entity? Julius is only acting so ridiculously stupid because he's possessed by the dark ancient spirit Vandal. Basically, Sib old nemesis. And you battle it out for the fate of the world.
Ultimately, Sword of Mana tries to pull the rug out from under the player by revealing the female protag's mother is the current mana tree. If you've ever played a mana game, that might be the least surprising reveal yet conceived by Koichi Ishii. Furthermore, she's only here to become the next mana tree. Again. Again. Coming to terms with this reality lets Sumo make up his mind and steal his resolve which awakens the Mana Sword. Julius admits that he doesn't believe the basic premise the player is given from the beginning, that mana is the source of all life on Earth. And so they battle one more time over ideas. Julius gets slaughtered, Willy says absolutely unironically, God bless this localization, and the female protag becomes the Mana Tree. So what did all that amount to? Ultimately, not enough. It retread old ground while enriching pre-existing characters, added a whole tome of world building and lore that isn't particularly relevant to the tale being told. And I know that's going to be contentious with some fans, but the basic story is Boy Wants Revenge for a terrible past trauma, struggles with becoming like the source of his trauma, makes up his mind and deals with the perpetrators while saving the world and perpetuating the status quo. And that's got nothing to do with the Mavolians or the Mana Tribe or anything. That's flavor in context to something that doesn't even need the extra layers of context, though I'd argue it's a lot more flowery and mana. Sumo became a fuller person, the world continues. There's something to say for the life goes on cliche. It gels with mana pretty well, being a story about nature and the natural state of things, trusting the cycle, but it does feel pretty outwardly religious too. Religious persecution is a recurring element in the lives of many characters and NPCs in game. Religiosity is baked into the thing from the creation myth to the New Testament title, but religious persecution is mostly rooted out by the very same issues Sumo grapples with in the story. Am I not just as bad as the tyrant for doing what he does? The game ultimately accepts that intention, context for violence, matters, and I have to agree. If a dictator and eventually a mage with delusions of godhood are trying to ruin the world for everyone, then yes, violence is good. I'm just imagining a commenter saying like, no, violence is never okay, they should have just had a reasonable debate. <laughs> it sells the idea that an ideal society is peaceful, realistic, honest, and able to accept the faults of those within, so long as they don't disrupt the world itself. It's a perspective I agree with, read charitably, and weaves really well with the concept of mana's gameplay, you know, allowing the player to be anything and handle it their way. I think the story would be a lot stronger just accepting that intentional violence is good instead of playing at morally gray and pretending the heroes are anywhere near as bad as Dark Lord and Julius, both murderers, one of whom presides over a stratified society and commits hate crimes. Granted, they wouldn't be storybook heroes unless they, you know, did a think about murder, but if they didn't, they might end up like 5,000 times more interesting. Context can't salvage the villains. It doesn't make them relatable, they're bad. They act as close as they can get to evil. Evil, as I understand it, being profoundly antisocial behavior. In short, the story plays with some big ideas, wobbles them around a bit, settles for a classic golden thread, and follows it to the end at the expense of spending screen time on anything more interesting. It's about as inoffensive as tissue paper and still, somehow shooting ahead of most mana stories in general, just for making an effort, framing itself as epic, sidling up to religious inquiry. So why? Why make this overlong, rambling video? How long did it take to get to the actual review? The actual game review was how long? This is a title that was broadly written off by critics, maligned and discarded by the broader fanbase, even if it's regarded by some today as worthy, and exists on legacy tech that few people bother with. But it's worth examination. It not only represents a gathering of elements across the entire series until its development, like collecting the Dragon Balls, it manages to spin an old tale again, and surprisingly well for the series part. It salvages the old and forges something new unapologetically. It exists to build the bedrock of the world of mana. It wouldn't use characters from previous games otherwise, or filter the world through Shinichi Kameoka's distinct style. And right around this time, in fact, right after this game, Square announced the World of Mana project, which I covered in the past, but told Quick it was the future of the series. We saw mana branch out in genre to multiple consoles, even the sole mainline entry from the period, Dawn of Mana, was highly mechanically experimental and took the visuals in yet another direction. It feels like in the wake of World of Mana, that Sword was an acknowledgement, or 
monuments of the series until that point. And indeed, the series experimented with long, epic narratives going forward, which may well be Sword's greatest individual contribution to the lineage. The last thing I want to touch on is Romantic Era art and mana. It's the era preceding the Victorian era of English art, if you're not aware, spanning visual art, poetry, everything, and it was characterized by a deep appreciation for nature, an anxiety over the enclosure movement that saw whole swaths of British wilderness parceled and sold in the name of industry, and an acknowledgement of the healing power of the natural world. And it stuck with me, shut and computer nerd that I am, because that's the world I'd rather be in. Someplace peaceful and idyllic, pastoral, undisturbed by noise and fear and want. Don't you want to feel the breeze and watch the clouds roll over a glittering lake, or press your hands into the warm grass on a sunny day? Mana is a simple game, but it emblemizes that yearning for the earth. Each game makes a point of pushing nature as powerful, worth protecting at any cost, and beyond any environmentalist message that's definitely bankrolled in, it represents a nostalgia for a time when we weren't bent over computers and keyboards and phones, just feeling being a part of nature, something that's increasingly become privileged as time goes by. All of this because Koichi Ishii wanted to capture a fantasy land like the forests in his youth were. I never found much emotion in mana, outside of the rare soul-crushing moment or two, but its flavor of pathos is a palpable longing for something that maybe never was. Nature is fun until you get wet and smoky and have to sleep in it. Maybe mana isn't even about glorifying nature, but memorializing childhood imagination. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolon, Alex, Alpha, 42, Arch, Azura, Axon Azuis, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Blake Against the Machine, Boa, Boom Dead, Brios, Brianna Wu, British Gooch, Cal, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Wade, C-Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Cordon, Chris Bromo, Cody Golden, Couch Mobile, Corgi the Lad, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Don Dio, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Jackie Stag, David Castillo, Dara, Dakota, Dennis Samaya, Dr. Cullen PhD, DSChabano.com, D. Terry M, Dylan Coffee, 8-Bit Thoughts, Elpio, Elsa, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Exa, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyph Seeker, Goose 6111, Gray, The Darkest Black, Gorkori, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, Max, Horn Tiger, Huey, I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer, Ingenious Cloud, I punched a sandwich, Irrational, Irradiated Cherry, Dice Kyle, it's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jacob. James. Jason Lash. Jaden. Jay Day. KK Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Fraud. Jordan Joyner. Julian My Julian. Keegan Too Cool. Kata Snack. King Kuma. Walk Crated. Crazy Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Heist. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalian. Matrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Loathsome Dung Eater. Warren. Low Fat Mogul. Lucas Boyd. Lucky McSmuggy. Mud Mac James. Magical Madman. Mara Ganger. Mercury. Mars Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Nyberg. Mike DeVere. Mickey Moore Fish. Wanna Chrome only. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Nido Torpedo. Nico Puzzle Rack. Dorian Deridius. Not Nobel. Old Burgle. Old Man Cranberry. Omni Nerd Zero. Omni LK. Complaint. Pandemic Cowboy. Pinata. PK Gaming. Hop you for Hitman. Potato Gaming HD. Prismatic Dan. Fractal and Pals. Kleiser McDougal. Quillworth. Quinn. Reasonable Willow. Reggie Rodriguez. Renteca Bond. Ricochet Frame. Wind Relay. Boy Wando. Ryan Mori Brooks. Siren Smells Good. Salty Smash. Scribe Slendy. The Guy No Award. Shod. Silver Bear 909. Sim God! Sleepy Wabbit. Suck em Bopper. Suck Dollager. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Storm Strider. Sublime Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Sean Guy. Shoving the Big Bubby. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Green Loki. The Salt Knight. The Dick Mystic. Drips Heart Drop. Tiggles McGuffin. Timid the Rider. Turtle Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chum. Ty Guy 9001. Vid. Valen Rift. Venom. Vice Puck. Viewers Like You. Vic. Waposa. Weed Trash. Wayland. Where Am I Help? Widgy. Winter Solstice. Wood TV. Zanny Tan. Yashichi. Yeet Zachary Livesey. Zachary Z. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Zalazar. Silvlin Ray. Z-Nova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash